morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending upon when you are listening to this broadcast. Welcome to Memorial Park Baptist Church and our service today. I want to say a special hello. I understand that there uh, might be uh, a person who is listening for the first time today, and I just want to give a shout out to Regina, and I'm so pleased that uh, this is going to be able to be a regular routine for you. As you know, we've been in the book of Revelation. We've been looking at first the church in Ephesus and what Jesus had to say about that church. And then last week we took a look at who Jesus is really. Does he have the authority to say these things? And I think we came to the conclusion that absolutely he does. He's divine, he's our creator, he's loving, he's caring, he's selfless. Uh, self-sacrificing to put himself on the cross not for himself but for us and we did talk about the church in Smyrna which was the second church that Jesus visited and I want to continue on with Smyrna just one more Sunday there's a story of a gentleman who was getting up in age and was having difficulty living alone and the family finally made that very difficult decision that he would need to go into a nursing home. Of course, he was not happy with that decision, but off he went. And that first day that he was in the nursing home, the staff very sensitive to the situation. Many of them came in to say hello, introduce themselves, uh, glad that he was there. And friends and family had sent him gift baskets and flowers and all that kind of thing. And he was sitting in a wheelchair looking out the window when this one staff person came in. and. On the windowsill was a bowl of nuts. And the staff person introduced herself and began to talk to him. And as she was talking to him, just probably not even thinking, she reached into the bowl of nuts and took a few nuts and ate them. And as she continued to talk, she continued to reach into the bowl of nuts. And before you know it, she had eaten half of the bowl. And she realized what she had done. And she was very apologetic to the uh, new resident. And the resident said to her, that's no problem, don't you worry. He said, when you're at my age and you don't have teeth, you suck off all the chocolate and leave the rest in the bowl. Guess that bowl of nuts wasn't what it appeared to be, was it? <laughs> it was leftover candy that had been sucked. Oh, just the thought of it. Uh, and there she had been eating all of these nuts. But that to me kind of describes the Church of Smyrna. Things weren't quite what they appeared to be. They were really having a difficult time. And so let's read the text and see what was going on. Jesus is now speaking and he's saying, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, these are the words to him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear, what the Spirit says to the churches, he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death, which there he is referring to the second coming of Jesus. This is what he had to say to the church at Smyrna. And to the world looking at this church, it didn't look at all like they were rich. They, they were having a hard time. And as we talked in the past, if you became a Christian, at that time, the Roman government viewed you as a traitor or uh, an atheist, that you weren't willing to worship their gods and bow down to the emperor as a god, and therefore you were a traitor and you lost a lot of your privileges. And these were very important privileges, like being able to hold down a job, sending your children to school, being able to sell anything in the marketplace. And so in some sense, it was true. They were very poor in the worldly sense. But Jesus said, 
They were rich. Now, how could that be? Because he's telling them here, Satan is going to persecute them. He's going to turn things up and make things difficult for them. And again, from the outward appearance, it would look as if God had abandoned them. But do you remember what God had to say to the church at Ephesus? He said many glowing things about them. And he had, he commented them, complimented them on a number of things. But he did have a criticism against them. You know, he said, yet I hold this against you, speaking to the church in Ephesus. You have forsaken your first love. Now, if you look at the, at the text in Smyrna, there's nothing but encouragement there. There is no criticism. Why? I think it's because even though they were going through a very difficult time, even though they were suffering because of their faith, they didn't give up. They had faith. You know, we all go through seasons of bad times. Some seasons last longer than others. Some seasons are much more difficult than others. Some seasons are extremely painful. And what is our reaction when we have a bad season in our life? Well, a lot of times what will happen is we begin to worry. We begin to fear what might happen. We become anxious and we become depressed. And unfortunately for some people, their depression is so severe that they take their own lives. They cannot tolerate this life any longer. In 2019, the CDC released suicide rates in the United States. It may shock you to find that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death of all age groups in the United States when you put them all together. But it's the second leading cause of death in children, teenagers, and young adults between the ages of 10 and 34. Can you imagine a 10 year old so distraught with life that they would take their own life? It is the fourth leading cause of death in those who are approaching middle age, those who are age 34 to 35 to 44. This next statistic really blew me away. There are two and a half times more suicides in the United States than there are homicides. Wow. And we know since the pandemic started in 2020, early in 2020, that these rates have only gone up. So what made the Samaritans, the, the church in Smyrna, different? I believe it was because of their faith. And what exactly is faith? Do you remember that great faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11? It begins with these words. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's quite a statement. The, the church in Smyrna was not seeing right now any relief, but they were certain that there was going to be relief ahead. Even if their lives ended in death, they were going on to a better place. A better world and that's where they kept their their focus on they trusted what Jesus had said they trusted that they would have eternal life if they put and pledged their allegiance to Jesus and confessed their sins and acknowledged him as their Lord and Savior so of course the question always is well how do we get more faith you know I have faith but sometimes it's not enough and I want more faith well what do we need to do well the book of James tells us we don't have because we don't ask. We need to first ask God to give us more faith. And then we need to expect that that faith will come. You know, we read in Matthew chapter 7, and Jesus is now giving the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
we need to be expecting when we ask to get an answer. But we also need to understand our limits. You know, the Apostle Paul uh, wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, of course, the great love chapter, but he says in verse 12, he says this, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror that we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully as I am fully known. You have, I have, I think we all have probably looked in a fogged mirror that was fogged up from the steam of the shower or the bath and we don't quite see our, our, our uh, acute image of ourselves. And we have to wipe the fog away or turn the, the um, oh, I can't even remember what it's called now, but we turn it on and, and it takes the uh, steam away. Well, what we need to understand is that we only see in part. That doesn't mean that what we see is the only thing that God is doing. He is very much at work behind the scenes. And there are times that it takes him a while to be able to get things to where they need to be to give us that answer. We have that old uh, example in Daniel. Well, Daniel prayed and then the angel came to him, but he had been delayed. He said, I'm sorry, I was delayed. I had to take care of this battle over here before I could come to you. So it doesn't mean that God is not hearing our prayers. He's not answering our prayers. He will, he has to put some things into place. And so it all boils down to, do we trust him? Do we have enough faith in him to help us in our dark hours? Now this is not, God is not a candy machine. He's not, you know, we put in a prayer and we're gonna get out exactly what we want. He will give us what is best for the person that we are praying for and for us. And sometimes what we are praying for is not what's best for that person, even though we think it is, because we can't see the future. We don't know what's going to happen down the road to that person, but God does, and in his mercy removes him from that. And so how powerful do you really think faith is? Well, I want to give you a couple examples. The American Academy of uh, Family Physicians, they did a survey among family physicians, and one of the questions that was asked was, do you believe there is a relationship between a person's faith, whatever that is, a person's faith and healing? And the result was astounding. 99% said yes, they did believe that. They have seen it with their own eyes. Harvard Medical School had a conference on this very topic of spirituality and healing. And over a thousand healthcare workers came to attend that conference because they were interested, they were intrigued. They perhaps had seen some things happen that should not have happened under normal circumstances. You may have heard about the California study that was done um, they had about 200 patients who had heart disease and they separated them into two groups and the patients did not know which group they were in. In fact, they didn't even know what was going to take place. Half of the group, 100 of them, the researchers found somebody to pray for that particular person. They found 100 people willing to pray for Joe and Jane and Susie and John and so on over their health. And they had no idea they were being prayed for. The other 100 had no one praying for them. At the end of the study, they found that those who had been prayed for had half the amount of complications than those who had not been prayed for. And that was the only difference in the two groups was prayer. Well, Dartmouth Medical Center uh, took this a little bit further, the medical school, and they decided to take a look at uh, heart patients who were going to go through uh, bypass surgery. And they asked half of those 
to pray for themselves that their healing would be uh, rapid, that they would not develop complications and so on and so forth. And the other half, they didn't say anything. They didn't ask them to pray for themselves. They just left them alone. At the end of the study, it was amazing. They all underwent their open heart surgery then. And six months after surgery, twice as many were still alive who had prayed for themselves than those who didn't. And the most fervent, the most uh, uh, faithful religious patients, none of them died. The power of faith, the power of prayer, it's at our fingertips. We don't have to have money to buy prayer. We don't have to have a certain status. We all can pray in our own way for ourselves and for others. It's very, very important with faith. You know, when we look at the Bible, God did reward those who put their trust in him. Let's think, for example, Abraham and Sarah were told that they were going to have a son. Abraham was 90 when they were told that. Sarah was 80. 10 years went by and they had no son. And they ended up doing what? They, they decided that they, they were supposed to do something about this. And so Abraham had a son by another woman. But that was not God's plan. And when Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 100, guess what? Sarah got pregnant. God was faithful in fulfilling his promise. King David. King David was anointed king while Saul was still king. Saul had disobeyed God and God was going to take the kingship from him. But Saul wasn't about to let go of the kingship and he fought against God about that. And David was on the run for many years. He was in a dark season of his life. He wasn't living in the splendor of the palace. He was living in dark caves. He had to have men that he could trust to bring him food. And this just didn't go on for a month or two or even a year. It went on for years. But you know what? King David finally did become the rightful king and lived in the palace. God was faithful in his own time to bring that promise to pass. I don't know if you've heard the advertisement on, on uh, Christian radio, but Sight and Sound, which many of you are probably familiar with in Lancaster, is doing the play of Esther. And if you remember the story of Esther in the Bible, she became the king's wife. Uh, she was Jewish, she did not know that. There was a bad man who wanted to kill all the Jews. And so he tricked the king into putting out an edict to have all the Jews killed. And Esther's cousin came to her and said, you got to do something. You got to go into the king and plead for, our, for your life and for ours. She didn't want to do it. She said, he could kill me. I mean, if I go into him unsummoned, he could just have me killed. I can only go into him when he summons me. And her cousin said, you got to do it. So what did she do? She prayed and she fasted. And that gave her the strength to do what she had to do. And she went in. And the king was so pleased to see her. And to make a long story short, the bad guy who tried to kill all the Jews got himself killed and the Jews were spared because Esther took the courage in trusting in God, believed in his faithfulness, and she herself was faithful to her people to let the king know that she was Jewish and by this edict, she herself would be killed. And the story ends with, you know, the bad guy being killed instead. And so there is another example of faithfulness. And what about Noah? Do you know what, you know, how many people laughed at Noah building this huge ship, like on dry land? How are you gonna get it to the ocean, Noah? <laughs> He's an old man. He's probably got dementia. Well, he mutters to himself, what do you expect? You know, he was made, he had to have been made fun of and ridiculed. 
And it took a long time to build the ark. And yet God was faithful. When the ark was built, guess what? The rains did come. And Noah and his family were spared. But I think the best example that when I think of faithfulness and, and I think of trust is how Jesus treated Peter after he had denied the Lord three times. How would you feel if somebody denied you, denied knowing you, denied um, anything about you when maybe you had helped them a great deal? Well, we find in the Gospel of John that Jesus was very forgiving and he restored Peter to his position as an apostle. And Peter went on to do mighty things for the church. Is it possible that because of our faithfulness in standing firm with the Lord, regardless of the troubles and trials that come our way as they were coming here to the church in Smyrna, is it possible that our names could be put in the chapter of faith? You know, when we read that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, the verse, verse 2 says, this is what the ancients were commended for. Would we also be commended for being faithful? for standing strong and true despite the trials and tribulation that comes our way to try to trip her up, to try to trip us up? Is it possible that this church, Memorial Park Baptist Church, collectively, with all the woes that churches are facing today, because most people in society are not in church, they make fun of Christians, they're making difficult things for Christians, and attendance is going down and down, and the pandemic has certainly not helped uh, with that. Could it be possible that in another revelation that Jesus might say to the church in Vestal, the church of Memorial Park Baptist Church, could he say these words to us? When we, things are down in our lives, what's the most important thing we need to do? We need to be looking up at our Savior. We need to remember God's promises to us, to never leave us nor forsake us, to walk alongside of us. We are to cast our burdens upon him because he cares for us. The question this morning is not so much if God is faithful to us. The real question is, are we faithful to him? Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, help us. Help us in our times of dark seasons in our lives to not be discouraged, to not give up, but to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you, to know that you are right there with us, walking through the shadow of death, if that happens to be what's in our troubles, or whatever else it might be that we can count on you. May we put our full trust and count you as our faithful God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.